How many different ways can you interpret Genesis? Follow along as we do some theological gymnastics on Creation Magazine Live. Generally, to understand Scripture, you interpret Scripture with Scripture. And every conservative theologian would say you take the Bible in the way the text is written. You read it, in, in other words, straightforwardly. You read the sections about history as historical narrative. Poetry is the, poetry. Poetry is poetry, exactly. Now, those rules, uh, and conservative scholars would agree across the board with that, but they don't seem, in some cases, to apply them to Genesis. Genesis is a special case, because if you apply those same understandings of Scripture, the same interpretive principle to Genesis, you get God creates recently in six literal days followed by a global flood, and there's no death of people or animals before sin enters the world. Right. But that would mean that the fossil record is young, and you have to dispense with the millions of years in evolution, and so many Bible scholars, even the conservative ones, have become convinced that the millions of years are a, an established fact. Right. So you have to reinterpret Genesis differently than the rest of Scripture. So they've come up with some creative ideas. And yes. you'll see them in the quotes. For example, Berkeley Mickelson, a former professor of New Testament interpretation at Bethel a Theological Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota, he wrote a book on hermeneutics, interpreting the Bible. And all the way okay. through, he yep. says, you should take the Bible as plainly written. That's the, that's, the, that's the way we take the virgin birth. That's the way we take the, the, the resurrection, etc. Right. But when it comes to Genesis, he says stuff like this. The age of the universe, the nature of light and time and procedures by which God prepared the earth for habitation of man are not touched upon at all in the Bible. Interesting. It, it's, <laughs> it's easy to see that, that he's wrong because the age of the universe is very much touched on in the Bible. Right. You've got the days of creation in Exodus 20, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rest of the seventh day. It's not just in Genesis. The basis for a six-day work week, not a six-million-year work week. And That's right. We can, we can discover these things from Scripture, <laughs> very much. Bernard Ram, a uh, very influential apologist of the latter part of the 20th century, he also ignored the plain language that you can see there in, 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 in creation. He actually stated this, no interpretation of Genesis 1 is more mature than the science that guides it. So he's put science above Scripture. Right, you scripture can't understand secondary. Genesis yeah. until you have modern science that tells you about millions of years. And, uh, and, and of course, that's very inconsistent again because if you apply that to the rest of the Bible, well, you're not going to believe that Jesus came back to life because science has shown that dead people don't come back to life after three days. Yes. So the yep. atheists, they'll quickly you know, take you to task on this, right? Bernard Ram also said this, if uniformitarianism makes a scientific case for itself to a Christian scholar, that Christian scholar has every right to believe it, and if he's man and not a coward, he will believe it in spite of the intimidation that he has supposedly gone over to, into the camp of the, the enemy. Uniformitarianism is uh, championed by Charles Lyell. The present is the key to the past, particularly in geology. If you see those sediments being laid down very slowly today, that's always been the case, which means there wasn't a global flood. But the scripture does say, for example, in 2 Peter 3, that the scoffers will come in the last times, and one of the things they're going to say is that all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And they'll deny a global flood. They're flood deniers, is what they are. That's and right. And we have flood deniers today. As Christian scholars. Yes. Uh, here's another popular argument uh, that seems to be growing in evangelical circles, and, and that's that, well, that's not the point of the passage. That, that's their argument. You know, Genesis, it, it, that's not the point. Look, the, the point of Genesis is that God created man in his image, that man is special, and, and God is the creator. And perfection, and, and, and some and, type and stuff of moral like that. tale. But yeah. the details, it's not important. So we don't get to get bogged down with these details. Well, you got to wonder why God put these details in there there if they're not important. There's details all over Scripture that are vitally of, of important. Of course. <laughs> Look what the Apostle John says, right? Uh, he wrote uh, his, his gospel so that the reader might believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and in believing in him, you might have life in his name. That's the, the important part of the verse. But he also records that, uh, you know, Christ was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and that uh, Peter lopped off that guy's ear. With all those details, but, but they're not important. But, <laughs> you know, if, if you were selling your car, you right, and you put a post an ad in there and you say, well, I've got, you got a blue Honda Accord and it's got 115,000 kilometers on it and you're okay. selling it for five grand. And I get there 
and you've got a red uh, Toyota Datsun or, or whatever. It, it, and, and I mean, the point of your ad was, hey, you've got a car it's at a good price. Yeah, I got a good car for sale. But if I get there and the details are wrong, what am I really going to think about uh, the importance or the, or the legitimacy of your, of your ad? In details total? are kind of important. They really are, especially where scripture comes in. Formed by a volcanic eruption in 1963, the island of Circe near Iceland has intrigued scientists because it looks like landscapes most think are much older. According to a new scientist article, the island has excited geographers who marvel that canyons, gullies and other land features that typically take tens of thousands or millions of years to form were created in less than a decade. Biologists have also marveled at how quickly plants, animals and birds have colonised the island. The Icelandic Institute of Natural History put it this way, we now now have a fully functioning ecosystem on Surtsey. If you visited the island of Surtsey and weren't aware it was less than 50 years old, I wonder how old you'd consider it to be. The next time you hear that a particular landscape took millions of years to form, remember the island of Surtsey, because things can be misinterpreted as being much older than they really are. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Okay, how about the framework hypothesis? Um, you know, Genesis should not be, be a historical narrative. It's simply a literary, literary framework. Um, so it's not to be viewed as a strict chronological account of events or, or anything like that. This is the framework hypothesis. Now, if people are having a difficult time, well, what, is, what does that mean? Think of like Aesop's fables. That they're not real history. They're, uh, you know, they're mythical stories, but they, they contain important teachings. So it right. doesn't really yeah. matter the whether hair, the, the hare ever, the, uh, you know, uh, ran a, a race with the tortoise. It just matters that, you know, it, it patience pays off. And if you just stick through it, that's the best way, like the tortoise was. It doesn't have to be real. It just it's a good idea. Yeah, framework hypothesis is pretty difficult to define, but uh, but that's a that's an attempt at it anyway. It's <laughs> yeah. pretty close. So Meredith so. Klein, uh, Westminster uh, Theological Seminary, he was one of the most uh, you know he, he championed this this uh, understanding. He said to rebut the literalist interpretation of the Genesis Creation Week propounded by the Young Earth theorists is a central concern of this article. That's his main point. I want to get rid of this concept that Genesis could be taken as plainly written. He said the conclusion is that as far as the time frame is concerned with re respect to both the duration and sequence of events, the scientist is left free of biblical constraints in hypothesizing about cosmic origins. His whole purpose for this framework hypothesis is to make it so the scientists don't have to adhere to what the Bible says. Yeah, that's, yeah that's interesting. That's what he just said. And, and he greatly dislikes the young earth creationist position, yep. and, and he called this a deplorable disservice to the cause of truth. That's right. So looking at the details of how God created is a deplorable disservice? To, <laughs> That's what he's the, saying. To the cause of biblical truth. That's right. Interesting. Now, framework uh, proponents, they, they, they rely heavily on this concept of, of poetry because they're thinking of, you know, well, that Genesis is just, a, just poetry. And, of course, they look at what Hebrew poetry is based on, which is the concept of parallelism. Okay, so you, you, you for example, in the Psalms, you'll see this illustrated. So Psalm 49, 1. Hear this, all you peoples. Listen, all who live in this world. Okay. See, line one and line two, they kind of parallel each other. Basically, you're saying the same thing in a different way, and then they're right together, so they're, they're parallel, right? Yeah. It's a form so, of Hebrew poetry. So if you see the, see the chart here, see if Genesis is just poetry. So you've got day one, two, and three. That parallels with day four, five, and six. So one and four go together, two and five go together, okay, etc. So they've taken that as a clue that no, 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 Genesis isn't real history. The details don't matter. It's poetry, you see. Poetry, that's yes. right. Once you look into the details, you, you've got some problems here. Um, see, it's true that the creatures of the sea were created on the fifth day, but that's supposed to parallel with the second day. See the sky and the waters were separated? Yeah, if you have a look at yeah, day two and five are supposed to line up. Yeah, but, but the fish... Water was created on day one. When you read the Genesis account, God creates the water on day one. So if you're going to line up the fish with the water, you should have day one and five okay. stuck yeah. together, not you know, the other way around. And then if you look at day four, the sun, moon, and stars is lined up with day one, which is light and darkness separated. But wait a sec. The sun, moon, and stars went into the firmament, but the firmament wasn't created until day two. So really, so you should have day four should two be and, lined up with two. Right, but then you'd have to rearrange the days, and that, that's not written like that in the Bible. So it's really not as, uh, 
as as neat and tidy as they would like it to be. No, and and the framework proponents will actually say that young earth creationists are biblical creationists. We're we're guilty of eisegesis. We're reading into it something that's reading not there. Reading into the text, yes. Well, wait a second. They're the ones <laughs> that are reading into this. Here's another concept with this uh, parallel thoughts here. Um, in Hebrew poetry, like when I read Psalm 49, this line paralleled this line within, like literally the next line. Here what they're taking is lines of, of Scripture that are separated by many, oh, many verses. Many verses in between and trying to make it uh, as though that's an example of Hebrew parallelism. And if you did that with the rest of the Bible, there are many accounts that are repeated in the Bible. You'd have to start saying whole whole books of the Bible were poetry if you were to apply that consistently. So they're looking for patterns that aren't really there. Right, right. So, you know, it's interesting when you look at something like the Apostles' Creed, right? Uh, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. All these things in, in the Apostles' Creed were written to challenge the Gnostic heresy. And, and the concept was there, the, you know, the Gnostics were saying that, well, you, you just replace ideas in theology, right? And, and basically, when you look at the framework, it's a back to the same concept. Creation.com is the world's most powerful internet resource for finding answers to questions about the origins debate. It includes an online store where you can browse through hundreds of the world's leading creationist books, DVDs and related materials. Scientists and researchers from around the world have contributed more than 8,000 articles, many of which have appeared in leading creationist publications over more than 30 years. Creation or Evolution? When the results are in, which one is supported by scientific observations? Find out at creation.com. Another creative interpretation of Genesis is that Genesis is just a polemic. It's just a refutation of other origins accounts. Right. So the idea here is you redefine the Genesis account as nothing more than, a, than an argument against the surrounding you know, religious ideas of the day. Yes. And uh, Conrad hires a former professor of comparative mythology and the history of religions at uh, Adolphus College, wrote this. In the light of the historical context, it becomes clear what Genesis 1 is undertaking an accomplishment. A radical and sweeping affirmation of monotheism via v polytheism, syncretism, and idolatry. Each day of creation takes on two principal categories of divinity in the pantheons of the day and declares that these are not gods at all, but creatures, creations of the one true, uh, true God, who is the only one, without a second or third, each day dismisses an additional cluster of deities arranging in a cosmological and symmetrical order. <laughs> So Hires here is proposing that each of the days of creation were just written to oppose the Babylonian and Egyptian and Assyrian versions of how the world came to be. Right, specifically targeting them in a, in a sense to yes. prove that theirs was wrong. Now, this, this claim fails for a couple, a couple of obvious reasons here. Number one, there's nothing in the text, in the Genesis text, that specifically points to, to some kind of argument against those, although the the, the, the account itself argues against those religions because it gives a different account of, of right. creation. Yes. And, and this is where his argument completely falls to pieces. What he's saying is that Genesis is just mythology used to counter other mythologies. But if none of them are truth... What's how, the wh point? What's the it, point? It all falls apart, doesn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, if it's not real history, then why would any uh, the, the Jews or the Christians, why could we point and say, hey, your guys' stuff is wrong? Oh, ours, yeah, it's wrong too, but yours is wrong because... It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, much of this debate really centers around the meaning of the word yom in right. Genesis. That's the Hebrew word for day. Yeah. And the Hebrew word for day, uh, people say, well, you can take it in different ways. Absolutely, you can take it in different ways. It has like a dozen different meanings, right. actually, actually more than that. Context is important. Context is the key. If you look at Genesis 1, it means an ordinary day. That's right. plain from the context. Genesis 2, verse 4, and the day that the Lord made the heavens and the earth, it's not a literal day. Right. You can see that from the context. Right. So, but uh, Walter Kaiser, uh, he's a respected Old Testament scholar, uh, he was actually on, in a debate, uh, the great debate, and on the John Ankerberg show, and uh, he, he stressed that context was king, but this is what he said about the days in Genesis. He said, my answer is that God had not yet created a 24-hour day. So too bad for Brown dr uh, Driver Briggs and too bad for Kohler Baumgartner because it specifically says, I mean, if we're going to stick with the Bible, God created days on the fourth day. So we've got three of these yams which are not, in the 20, not of the 24-hour days. Here's what his point was. God created the sun on day four. So therefore, the first three days, 
couldn't be days because you couldn't have a day without the sun. Well, we've talked about this before. In order to have a day, all you need is a light source and a spinning, rotating earth. And you had light right on God, day one. God provided the light on day one. So, you know, what he's saying here is that, well, the, the day one, two, three, they couldn't have been real days. Those yams weren't real days. And, uh, but, but now he's saying, well, well, yeah, but he doesn't even believe days four, five, and six are real days either. Yeah, so he's tying himself in knots here and, and right. the, the whole thing collapses again. Yeah, because yeah. if you're going to say, uh, you know, the, the four, five, and six, they're, they're real days. But wait, no, they're not real days because the first three aren't real days. Well, then what does the word yom mean, yes. right? Now, he, he tried to squeeze out of that by saying, well, they're possible candidates for 24-hour days. But it's interesting that his uh, debate partner on the debate was Hugh Ross, uh, who, of course, believes that the days four, five, and six were millions of years. Literal so. long periods of time, I think, is the way he put it, right? <laughs> That's right. Um, a uh, popular creationist argument would be uh, the creation of Adam and Eve. You know, when questioned about divorce, Jesus replied that, you know, right. uh, haven't you read that he who made them uh, in the beginning created the male and female? So obviously, Jesus is talking about, uh, you know, he got, uh, Adam and Eve being created at the beginning of the creation. He How can you have from the beginning? Right. Yeah, thirteen point something billion years uh, wouldn't be quite close to the beginning. Because Adam and Eve were created late on day six or so something to that effect. That's like. That's like going to a, like a New Year's Eve party, and it's just seconds before the new year is going to come in, right. and saying, well, and calling everything before that, well, that was the beginning of the year. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it really doesn't uh, make sense. Yeah. It doesn't make sense on the same level that it doesn't make sense to add millions of years into the Bible and say Adam and Eve were created from the beginning of creation. Dogs vary greatly in size, from Chihuahua to Great Dane, yet they are all part of the dog or wolf created kind. They can all interbreed. Researchers have found that the small breeds of dog have something in common, a mutation in a gene that codes for an important growth regulator. This prevents the small dogs growing to normal size. Mutations do that sort of thing. They destroy normal biological functions. Some of that destruction might be entertaining for us, producing cute miniature dogs that don't cost much to feed. But mutations won't create the complex blocks of genetic instructions needed to produce the growth regulator in the first place. Evolutionists say that mutations change dinosaurs into birds and apes into people. But how can mutations which destroy complex information do that sort of thing? Modern biology really shouts creation, not evolution. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Popular Christian comedian Tim Hawkins has a joke. He's talking about his mom spanking him and uh, for something he didn't do. And so when she oh. finds out that he actually didn't do it, it wasn't his fault, she, she, she doesn't seem remorseful at all. And he says, well, you know, why not? And she goes, well, that's for something you'll do later. <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, so she's punishing him ahead of time for something he's going to do later. Every one of the compromised positions, what we'd call a compromised position of Genesis, um, requires millions of years. If you're going to believe in theistical evolution, you believe in millions of years. You're going to believe in the day-age theory, it's millions of years. Each one of the days in Genesis um, couldn't have been literal days, et cetera, et cetera. You've got to accommodate the millions of years, et cetera. Yes, it's so, always about getting the millions of years into Genesis. All right. these different creative ideas right. to attempt to get the millions of years in there. The challenge is with every one of those positions, you put death before Adam's sins because the fossil record then occurred prior to the time of Adam's sinning in right. any one of those scenarios. And this is a huge problem. This is one of those, you know, could have had a V8 moments for, for a lot of people when they, <laughs> when they come to seminars. They're going, oh, yeah, there couldn't have been death before sin. Powerful theological argument for a young earth, right? Yeah, so. and a correct understanding of science and the fossil record stems from that understanding then. Right, right. Yeah. Now, to counteract what many long-agers uh, are attempting to do, to, to do this, yep. uh, it, they're, they're trying to get away from what the text clearly says. Right. Um, there's get around a new, death before sin. Get, death before sin. There's a, there's a new idea put forth by one of the folks from the intelligent design movement, mm -hmm. Bill Dembski. Yes. And his idea is retroactive death. So like the Tim Hawkins skit, the, the, the human race was, was essentially spanked by God before Adam actually sinned. Right. So it's a pre-punishment right. is, uh, is what he's getting at here. Yeah. Now, his, he says this is a biblical argument because what he's saying is, look, people, before, when, before Jesus came and died on the cross and, and rose again, and, and that, before that, that specific act, people were saved. People were saved retroactively. So therefore, he thinks it's biblical justification as why 
God could have retroactively punished and cursed the entire creation before Adam had committed the crime, so to speak. Yes. Right? Now, most people are familiar with the retroactive pay raise, right? You, they, they, it's a lump sum paid to you uh, on a calculation based on, you know, what, your, what your raise would have yeah. been. But now, that, most people would call that a good thing, but we also know about, you know, countries that have laws, retroactive laws, where you'd be punished for something uh, retroactively as well. So, so picture, you get a summons at your door one day, and the cop says, you know, Here, here's your fine. And you say, well, what's wrong? Well, you know, four years ago, you parked your car over there. Yeah, but there was no no parking site. Yeah, but there is now. So we're punishing you for what you did okay. then. Okay, an example you, of a retroactive law, right? In this case, and God doesn't operate that way. I mean, when you look in the Bible, you know, uh, Cain and Abraham, they they weren't punished for sin when they married their sisters or half sisters, because God did not yet created a law. God does not operate retroactively with with punishment, right. right? And Dembski's view of of uh, of people being saved retroactively is a bit off too, because actually the Bible says that Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world for sinners, and our names are written in the book of life, those who are believers, before the foundation of the world. So God saved people right from the beginning. Right. So in my viewpoint, I was saved when I was 27 years old. But God being outside of time, I was actually saved from the foundations of the world, if you read into the, you know, re read those scriptures that, that talk about those things, right? So, um, I guess what people will ask them was, well, why did Jesus have to be born and die and rise again in that specific time? Then if, if salvation has occurred from the beginning. And maybe we can look into an analogy, you know, uh, the, the bride of Christ, we're, we're you know, Christians, we're, we're part of the bride of Christ, we're married to Christ, and this analogy of marriage, we, we see that in the scripture. You know, in Jewish marriages, um, once the two were betrothed, they were considered married. I mean, you, you see this where, you know, when Joseph finds out that Mary's pregnant and he wants to divorce her quietly, but they actually hadn't had the, the ceremony yet, right. right? Yes. So they were considered married. He was going to have to get a divorce. Um, you were considered married. The only thing you didn't do is you didn't have the physical consummation. You didn't, you know, you weren't allowed to have sex before you yeah, had the actual... Uh, the wedding ceremony. Right. Right. So in the same way, when you, you think about the bride of Christ, the church, you know, um, there was a contract already in place. Christ's death on the cross was the actual consummation of why we can be saved, we can be part of the bride of Christ. Yes, but that was a yeah. contract that was already in place from the beginning, from the foundations of the world. Dembski's um, argument completely fails uh, because at the end of God's creation, he's pronounced everything was very good. And he's trying to get the bad stuff in, in millions of years before that point. Exactly. Creation Ministries International edifies the body of Christ by providing more than 30 years of Bible-supporting scientific research, delivered through speaking engagements, books, magazines, and a variety of media, much of which is archived on our website, creation.com. Did you know that if you read three articles on creation.com each day, it would take over seven years to read them all? Such a wealth of information didn't arise by chance, however. We do this through the faithful prayers and gifts of our supporters, which also fund ongoing research. Support the building up of the church by partnering with CMI. Donate today at creation.com slash donate. In this week's feedback, we're going to look at some feedback that, again, came through our website, creation.com. Right. It was actually a response to an article that, uh, Cal, that you did right. on uh, what all atheists need to believe. Right. And uh, so we had some feedback on that. Uh, this fellow writes in, he says, As an old earth creationist, I disagree with the literal six-day interpretation given in Genesis. Could God have created the universe and the world in six days? Of course. Science doesn't seem to, does seem to be painting a different picture, however. And according to Romans 1.20, natural revelation is a valid means of learning certain things about God. That said, I am human and I could very easily be wrong. And so he's convinced that, again, science supports the millions of years. Science determines uh, how you interpret the Bible. Yes. That's what he says. Yeah. Uh, a little bit later he says, I think that you and I would agree that the gospel of Jesus is the most important message in the Bible. Why risk having people lose their faith in that truth over a passage that can be read in a, in a few ways. Why guarantee that atheists will refuse to give the gospel a hearing over such passages? Right. Now, I, I answered him back, and, and uh, you know, when I'm at a Q&A session, if I'm out, you know, I, I don't want to get into an argument with a Christian. That, that's, I mean, we're both saved, we're both going to heaven. If we have differences of opinion, that's fine. Right. Really, my, my job is to equip the church, just like yours. Yeah, the age of the earth isn't a salvation issue. People yeah. can believe in millions of years so, and still go to heaven. So what I did, is, and I'll often do this when I'm, when I'm at a, uh, a meeting, is 
I'll answer them and say, well, listen, we don't have an argument, really. We're both safe. Well, how would you respond to what an atheist might say if you believe in millions of years, maybe believe God used evolution or whatever like that? And so in my article, I answered them back. I said, pretend I'm an atheist asking this question. And, and I posed some questions to him as if I was an atheist because I used to be an atheist. Yes. And so I've yeah. been on both sides of the fence, and I know how to argue this debate on, on both sides. Um, and so, uh, for example, when he said, as an old earth creationist, I disagree with a literal six-day interpretation given in Genesis. Well, as an atheist, uh, supposedly, I, I wrote back and said, well, why? Most Hebrew scholars agree that the days in Genesis were intended as literal days. Is it because science has disproven the Bible? Didn't the church fathers and the majority of Christians believe in a young earth and a six-day creation up recently until science proved it wrong? You know, so I, I was posing questions back to him as, as a skeptic rather than a, than a fellow Christian. Right. Um, just to try to get him to think. Like, because he, he was saying, well, why guarantee that people are going to reject the gospel if you, if you talk about... I was an atheist. To me, it was obvious. Yeah. God, yeah. There, there was no God. Evolution was a fact, and we've been around for millions of years. As soon as that got challenged, I was like, uh-oh, evolution's not true. There must be a creator. That's, that's what led me on that journey to salvation. Ultimately, it yeah. was God. But. And many of the people on our staff have a similar story. Exactly. Um, you know, he says, science seems to be painting a different picture. Well, so I answered him like a skeptic would. Well, science seems to be painting a different picture regarding talking snakes, talking donkeys, floating axe heads, and people living in whales for three days, virgin births and dead people coming back to life after three days. That's a terrible argument to use against a skeptic yes. because they're going to rip you to pieces. You have no logical way to defend that because if you're going to go with what science says, you might as well toss the Bible, water the into wine. Bible, yes. Come on, yeah. give me a break. Um, <clears throat> so, and he says, if the only valid reading of Genesis 1 were a literal six days, I can see insisting on this translation. Well, according to the original language, without any outside scientific influences, which he has already admitted to, science seems to be painting something else. That is the only valid way of yes. understanding the, the, the scripture. That's right. And any other of these uh, positions, millions of years and all that stuff, add death before Adam sinned. And many atheists, many skeptics know that argument, by the way, and they'll use it against you if you're not, and, and how do you counter it? That's part of the reason that atheists attack Genesis so much, because they know, they, the atheists know that Christianity has to accept a real historical Genesis with God creating recently in six real days, just like the text says. Right. Interesting news article recently I found. Temple yeah. to Atheism proposal splits non-believers. Uh, it said a proposal to build a 151-foot tower to celebrate new atheism in London has pitted some of Britain's most recognized non-believers against each other, the Guardian reports. Alain de Botton, a philosopher and writer, wants the tower built as an antidote to what he describes as the aggressive and destructive approach to atheism, such as Richard Dawkins. Right? He's saying, no, 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 let's, let's be, you know, be passive and just build our right. temple to yes. atheism yes. and stuff. And Dawkins says, well, we don't need temples, just improve secular education. Keep teaching evolution in the schools is what Dawkins is getting yeah. at. Interesting that that and, would be his tactic. And, and for those that don't believe the age of the earth is important, look at this. Um, de Bolton's plan for the tower would include each centimeter of the tower representing a million years of Earth's history. Millions of years is integral to the atheist worldview.